Hello again, everybody. You're listening to the Total Basis Podcast, and I'm your host, Felipe. Over there is my co-host, Sean Flannery. Sean, how are you doing this evening? We are good. We are good. Uh, first uh, look at the waiver wire about a month into the season. Uh, so we'll see how this goes. I'm shocked that some of these guys aren't more uh, talked about or well-known. Obviously, most of them have some sort of wart keeping them off, but uh, we'll try and sell each other and other people on these guys that we picked today. Yeah, in the meantime, I'm having a good week. I'm about to, I think I'm about to go three and no unless something catastrophic happens in all three of my le- in all three of my leagues or my all three of my teams. But I'm about to go three and no. I'm destroying my I'm destroying it this week in my points league. Uh I'm about to beat the crap, the living daylight and shit out of Melvin Lopez of the Baseball Cosmos podcast. So that's gonna be very gratifying. Yeah. I'm giving you the onomatopoeia in the background. Oh yeah, the, uh, I the, thought the, card, I, the, the cartoon one. <laughs> yeah, I, I thought uh, you sound a little bit like uh, the old Batman movies or uh, TV <laughs> shows, I should say. And I'm about to beat Leon Tompkins of uh, the Step Back Podcast, who uh, I sur- I was surprised that him and uh, Jacob went live yesterday in the basketball group to talk some playoff basketball. So that was good to hear. Fortunately, I was uh, out and about on my birthday. Uh, my oh birthday yes, celebration. Before we forget, happy belated birthday to the one no, and only. Uh, it's today yes well it's it's later in the day it's later in the day <laughs> it, it, w- it would be belated if it wouldn't have been belated if we did it this morning and we could just say happy birthday right off the bat but you've already been going about on your birthday day i had your birthday celebration last night so uh yes happy birthday to the uh ultimate second place finisher and uh <laughs> fantasy, I, believe i've been it. thinking about that i've been thinking about that like who, who am i because there's been you know i you know, I, I'm not, and it's not without, you know, that I go without championships. I mean, you could check out the banner right there. I'm about to. Uh, it finally, says football. It doesn't matter. I'm, I'm on. <laughs> I'm a quadruple threat over here. And you're uh, seven and one right now this year. Uh, I'm seven uh, and one in the baseball life league. I'm, and uh, I'm, I'm killing it in the podcast league. And the points league looks like if, if I can just get some pitching uh, starts, like get more than, you know, those dual eligible weekly starters which we're going to talk about today uh at least for one guy we're going to talk about um the sky's the limit the ceiling is the roof as michael jordan would say but you know i've also won a WNBA championship let that simmer for a little bit and i won <laughs> last year's podcast league which i must say it was a it was um it was brutal in terms of how active those guys were in the podcast league i mean they were out for blood and that was a free league it was a free league and people were like going out for blood and they're trying really hard, even though they're not admitting that they're trying really hard, but I could tell, I could tell they were very, um, you know, I had a big target on my back, but ultimately your boy wins that championship. So no, I'm not championship less. I'm about to go and, uh, treat myself as the kids would say to some, uh, birthday, pre- uh, get those, uh, birthday presents for myself and get those championship trophies that I've been wanting for those two championships from last year. So, yeah, but we're, we're, it's, is a, clearly this is a, a a hubris show for myself, but (laughs) uh, no, thank you for the kind words. Thank you for everybody. I I mean, I mean, I'm overwhelmed every year. The amount of birthday love I get from a lot of people, not just my friends, my closest family and all that, but just from strangers on the internet where everybody says that social media is bad. Uh, it's toxic, it's poisonous, this, that, and the other. But I, I've been, you know, been lucky to be surrounded by a group of guys like you and everybody else that we know, you know, the Henry Maldonados of the world, the Dong City guys, and everybody who um, who helped get these podcasts on the road during the pandemic. So, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm blabbering, but it's good. It's good that I'm able to uh, do this one more time with you again as well. As my mm-hmm. microphone decides to be kind of... Uh, winky here so i'm, I'm telling you I, I had the same thing right before we hit the record button my my mic cord was just all over the place yeah uh, might be time go. to uh, might be time to f- switch over to the tripod pretty soon but i like this little arm thing but it's i got but i got what, what i paid for for the uh yeah. for the microphone <laughs> that i paid for but it's been the microphone's been good to me as well anyway i'm blabbering but yeah thank you uh thanks to all the birthday posts all the birthday wishes i am the big four oh and uh, that means I'm over the hill. I should just quit while I'm ahead, uh, retire. <laughs> it's a, it's a young man's fun. game. <laughs> a young man's game. But no, uh, it, oh, but getting back to topic, uh, I realized that I've been doing a lot of thinking. Why do you mention second place perpetual win over here? Um, 
I'm pretty much the Mar- Marty Schottenheimer of, of fantasy circles. Yeah, yeah, that that would be a good one to call it. Always with the winning seasons, except for the points. Like the points is just really frustrating. But I think I'm finally getting it little by little. But yeah, Marty Schottenheimer always regular season dominance, and then get to the playoffs, and you know something always happens. You know, uh, one year I had Felipe Vasquez get arrested for. <laughs> you know well what was he well it was the uh uh he was uh hollering at a 13 year old no no uh, you no know, I, I know that's what he did but what was the name change because it was oh um, um carmona i think it was felipe carmona to felipe vasquez wasn't it no uh, oh, that no, was fosso Mar- carmona, fosso fosso carmona. um rivero something like that because i remember there was a name change it's yeah, like, oh, I, I think wonder he's... why you're trying to change your name. <laughs> yeah, that was very questionable, but he said that it was because Rivera, his sister... Felipe Rivera. I think that's what it was. So his new name was Felipe Rivera at the end. Uh, no, it was... well, I'm just this is okay. Yeah, Felipe Rivera became Felipe Vasquez. Yeah, he said that because his sister means the world to him, so he decided to pick up on the. The name that his sister took with she got married. I believe that was a story, right? Yeah. And because it was his sister that he respected so much that he just wanted to uh, show her respect uh, by changing his name to Vasquez, which is the uh, the husband's surname. And yep, he's still on the restricted list. Is he still in prison? <laughs> I think. I mean, he got locked up for a long yeah, time. Yeah, that was. Um... And remember, that cost me my uh, probably a fantasy championship because the Pirates were just uh, winning these. A lot of games, but they were like a lot of tight, close games. And Vasquez was scoring me like fifty points a week just alone, just because he was getting so many saves per week. It seemed like yeah, yeah. So he was sentenced to two to four years in state prison, beginning August of twenty twenty one. With two so, to three years, two to four years. Oh, that's it. Yeah, I thought it was a lot more than that. Well, I it was he, like... he is still facing charges in Missouri and Florida. So. Mm. Because apparently well, he didn't go on trial until 2021. So oh, Lord. Yeah, probably good, the, good old the wheels of justice move slowly. Yeah, well, the pandemic, I'm pretty sure had yeah. a lot to do with it. or But who knows? Uh, I, How did yeah. we even get on this topic? <laughs> oh, uh, a hard luck loser over here that you're talking uh, to. You're, you're, you're a co-host who doesn't know what the hell he's talking about, knows what he's doing. I, I end up getting all these, rack up all these regular season wins, but I don't win the big one. So I don't know what the fuck I'm talking about. So there, I'm a... I don't even know why you guys are listening, honestly. <laughs> but anyway, let's talk about the but unsung heroes or under the radar uh, players that are still available in most in fifty percent of fantasy leagues. I went with CVS Sports, and uh, Sean has his percentages from Fantrax. Yes. Let's start with pitchers. Your first guy was Dane Dunning. Why the hell are you going with Dane Dunning on this? Well, one? Jacob Degrom is now on the IL. Dane Dunning has had a nice little start out of the bullpen. He's already actually had to pick up the slack for DeGrom uh, when he left a couple of other starts early um, and had some pretty good results. Obviously not the flashiest name out there, but Texas is leading the American League West. Maybe he inserts into that rotation. You can grab a few wins. He's not going to light up the world in terms of strikeouts. His season high in strikeouts this year out of the bullpen was five, and that was in four and a third inning of relief against Kansas City about a two weeks ago, but uh, pitched in relief of DeGrom, three and a third innings. Uh, we gave him two runs, one strikeout, no walks. So it's the very uh, vanilla oatmeal, but a guy that could maybe just consistently go five, six innings and has a, a good team behind him. So uh, maybe pick up some wins there. Uh, the Pitching was very bare when I was kind of looking at under 50% owned. Uh, yeah. So I, I went with a guy who's on a good team. So that's <laughs> simple as that. Yeah. And, you know, it's funny you mentioned the whole the ground thing because there was a guy that they brought up uh, to replace him on the roster, on the major league roster. And that guy is uh, an old, uh, an oldie of ours, right? Remember we do these minor league shows, right? And that minor league pitcher that they brought up was none other than Yeri Rodriguez, who I thought I saw that he was a 59th ranked prospect now unless i'm wrong unless i, I was seeing things i could have sworn it was the same year rodriguez that we talked about back in the off season of 2021 uh texas rangers remember we, we had your guy trevor on the show as well and uh you went with george kirby as one of your pitchers and yohan duran was one of my pitchers you picked matthew allen but i ended up the last guy on the list was yeri rodriguez 
Uh, he was hmm. 23 at that time. Um, 96 ranked overall by the Fangraphs top 100. Good fastball. I, I, like I vaguely remember it, but uh... great changeup. Well, that's why I have these spreadsheets, man. Oh, there you go. Uh, this is what I wrote. He has an advanced east to west command. Has a raw curveball. Yields high strikeouts. There's a lot of injury concerns. Oh, a lot of injury concerns. Yeah, he's he's relief pitcher only now, so. Um... Yeah, but yeah, he, he has had some pretty solid numbers, though. It's like when you said that name, I was like, "Who the hell is Yuri Rodriguez?" And now that I kind of go back and look at the numbers uh, around that time, I'm like, "Yeah, we would have liked this guy." <laughs> yeah, so that's what they did. He, well, he was starting then. He was striking out guys, low ERA, keeping the walks in check. But I, I can definitely tell why I would have completely forgotten about him because he's just basically RP only now. Are you sure about that? Because uh, he's still ranked uh, in the top 60, I thought. In, in, in terms MLB? of prospects. Yeah, uh, somebody ranked them. That, that's when I saw the, the little ticket track or whatever it's called. That's what they said about him that he's a top 60 prospect this year. No, that can't well, be. Let's find out. Let's see. Fangrass. Yeah, he, he's pitched seven innings, no starts. Last year, he pitched in 49 games, five of them starts, only 59 innings. Mm. unless it's like mm. like I, no that he he was uh tagged in the top 50 for texas rangers back in june of last year for 2022 they haven't fangrass hasn't released the 2023 top prospects for uh texas yet yeah this is strange yeah he got called up last year uh for one game yeah and i see that he was tagged as a top 50 huh, what the hell was i looking at i could have sworn he was ranked number 59 overall which didn't make <laughs> was, any sense i was, I was about to be like no way <laughs> maybe well, back make, then maybe back then i don't know it, it didn't make sense no no he was like bare on the top 100 list remember but it didn't make any sense but i went with it unless they're talking about some other guy named gary with a y but no that's him gary rodriguez I'm, I'm telling you oh well you know easiest thing we could do is we can go to the fan graphs roster resource page and t- tag the uh click on the texas rangers click on the texas rangers sorry and I'm, I'm doing this as uh on the air you guys can't see it yeah yeri rodriguez recall from the minors is it the same yeri rodriguez yep yeah it looks like it yep, yeah it's the same guy he's so bullpen. 25 year old <laughs> yeah, he's a bullpen right now but i i, I honestly could have sworn that he was ranked uh as a highly taught at, like top 59 or something but anyway. that number is really just sticking in your head <laughs> I know I, I know I saw things. I know I saw it, but at any rate. That well, anyway, we this is, wasn't about Yeri Rodriguez, it's about uh Dane Dunning, who um it did get called up. He is listed uh in the rotation as of right now, right? You say you saw that? Well, he he just he has been in the bullpen all year, uh Dunning has. Oh, I didn't um, even realize it. Yeah, he, he's he's actually been like kind of solid coming out of the okay. bullpen. Uh, you know, DeGrom had a couple of the short stops, Dunning would come in, give him bulk relief innings. Um uh, I mean, they've kept them stretched out, ready to be a starter, especially now because, you know, with DeGrom on the IL, Oda Rizzi's on the IL, and then both Spencer Howard from the Phillies trade, mm-hmm. um, and then Glenn Otto, who's a guy that we've talked about on the show before. All those guys are injured. So uh, they went from having pretty good starting pitching depth to um, trouble in the South. So uh, the only other guys that are under 40 man that could be starters – our former top prospect Cole Wynn, who has just slogged through the minor leagues, n- no good production really, but former uh, first round pick. So, you know, those guys get ultimate chances. And then Taylor Hearn, who's been kind of their swingman lefty, but they, they just recently demoted him earlier in the year. So I, I think it's pretty obvious Dane Dunning's going to just hop into that fifth spot in the rotation and they're going to keep chugging along. Well, the Rangers do have a bunch of uh, prospects and, and- they're um, kind of underwhelming right now, but still, these are guys that I'm actually keeping track of this year, just at least to start, especially to start the season. And those guys are, you ready for this? Of course you are. Of course. Jack Leiter is one of them, and he's been sucking. So I don't know if that's going to happen. How's he been doing this year? I, I know he struggled last year, but that was a really aggressive assignment for me. Yeah, another six ERA through five starts this year. I <sighs> thought he had... Did you say he has a five, uh, five ERA? Six and a half, a little over uh, six point seven. He had five and a half last year in twenty two starts. Which I mean, I get like he was like super touted, but going straight to the double A level, like I, that one really, I, I guess because he was drafted, well, that wouldn't have been COVID. No, 
So yeah, just he went straight to double A. That always seemed just so odd to me. He's in double A again, running yep. into a lot of the same issues. Yep. So, yeah, that yeah, I don't I would not expect him coming up anytime soon. Well, that's why I, I put him that high because I am well, he's the 17th best prospect on my list. It's a list of how many people are in this thing. Let me say control. Go back, see what this looked like. This has uh 45 pitching prospects to keep an eye on. Because you never know, right, Sean? You never know. know. One of these guys is going to hit. Oh, and uh, it's one player from each team has to be represented. That's how I did it. Because, you know, everybody, there's a revolving door at pitcher every time. So Jack Leiter, number 17. Number 22, Kumar Rocker. Number 23, Owen White. And you just mentioned him, number 27, Cole Wynn. Yeah, Cole Cole Wynn, I I was just looking at. Somebody finally gave up on him in our 30-team league. And well, in one of my 30 team leagues, our other 30 team league, I got to give a shout out to them at zero dark 30. We had a guy pop up in our DMS uh, in the group DM on Twitter. And he was like, what if we just have a day where we all come together and everybody drops their guy that they've been holding on to for way too long because they used to be a top prospect or they had like hype for like three months at one point. And so we saw a couple of fun names about, I think four teams, Four or six teams took part. I dropped a few guys, even though I just took over the team. It sucks. But um, it was like Nick Solak got dropped. Then literally the next day, uh, Nick Solak had been claimed on waivers just a few days before the, the Braves. And then the Braves called him up right after this guy dropped him. <laughs> and he was like, of course. But uh, yeah, so Colwyn, six ERA this year, six ERA last year in AAA. Uh, it's just he's he's kind of stalled out. And um but like I said before, those first former first round picks, they will uh, keep getting their chances these days. One of those pitching prospects, like we mentioned, they will kill you. Uh, Grayson Rodriguez is kind of an up and down for me. But hey, you know what? As long as he keeps facing the Detroit Tigers, I'm happy. <laughs> uh, ahead of, uh, and I know this is off topic, but ahead of Jack Leiter is Luis Ortiz of the Pittsburgh Pirates and Cole Henry of the Washington Nationals. They're all about the same age. Uh, out of those three guys I just mentioned, who do you like? None of them. <laughs> okay. Not even Luis Ortiz and his 70 great fastball. Yeah. It's just, I, I think Pittsburgh right now is they kind of have their guys and it's working for them. So I don't expect too much to really change there. And it, I think Ortiz is what still in double a. He, he, in he made it to the major league level last year. So, you know, he pitched last year. Yeah. Yeah, man. How many games did he pitch? Uh, four uh, games. You know, he had four starts. Okay. Yeah, that's a lot for a guy like him. Six innings, four four starts, and then this year six starts. Yeah, yeah, not, not crazy about it, but we'll see. Yeah. Of those three, that that is my pick to click. Of all those three, is uh, Luis Ortiz. So I'll be keeping him he, very he close. Seems like side. a guy who's that's is like more like you would expect with this stuff to be. Um, really striking out a lot of guys but it, mm-hmm. it almost seems like it's one of those like very hittable high high grade mm-hmm. stuffs the the no cinder guard ask profile type so damn all right <laughs> well i mean like that was the thing like and then that's not necessarily a bad thing it's i mean dustin may is the same way jordan hicks these are guys that were throwing 102 mile an hour sinkers but just the way they moved and were shaped like people hit it i mean mm. it, it's like you, you just can't bring yourself to think about how these guys throw these wicked of pitches that move as fast as they do and go as fast as they do, but major league hitters had time it up pretty well on them. So uh, it's like, I, I guess Syndergaard out of those three probably had the highest upside so far. Dustin May obviously still could be a really good pitcher, but I saw a lot of people this year talking about Dustin May, like, Oh, he's going to strike out more guys this year. He has more strikeouts left in the tank, but it's like it, when I see him pitch, it's like, a, it's very much of the Jordan Hicks, Noah mm-hmm. Syndergaard mold where it's like, yeah, he throws a hundred mile an hour sinkers, but it doesn't really miss bats in his, like he's really good at inducing weak contact, which Noah did as well. But, what you're telling me here is that he ain't no Spencer Strider is what I'm no, saying. So. No, 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 no. Uh, number two on this list, Sean, is my guy. Logan Allen from the Cleveland Guardians. Recently uh, just made his debut, no? Or two starts. Had, he, he had two he's starts he's already had two starts already. Yeah. And uh, 
Uh, looks like he might stay. Well, him, then him and uh, uh, Bibby, right? That's yeah, his other Tanner name. Bibby, yeah. Tanner Bibby. I, I went ahead and I added Tanner Bibby in the baseball life league. I wasn't able to get him in for his major league debut start, but I was like, oh, yeah. I was shocked that he hadn't been picked up in our league. Yeah. Well, so far, those guys are doing a lot better than whatever Zach, uh, please band-aid. Zach and Cal Quantrill. <laughs> well, that's what I mean. Whatever band-aid rotation the Guardians are trying to pull off. I mean, they've been getting away with it the last couple of years, but I think the, the bottom Hunter might be Gattis falling guy, off. Hunter Gattis was in there. And- yeah. It's like just uh, they, you knew they had these prospects in Double A, Triple A. Gavin Williams, uh, Espino is hurt still, but oh, he might uh, be out for the year now. Well, I, I've heard that like he had like a setback, and then they were like, yeah. I, I think there's like a differing of opinions on what's wrong with him, and so they, they're sending him off to some sort of specialist because I'm I'm thinking somebody thinks that he's too hard to pitch, and I think there might be another party in that group that thinks he could pitch. Uh, that's just kind of the vibes I'm getting in f- from a little bit of what I've heard. So we'll see. So I'm trying to uh, keep track of the stuff that we're talking about. And so far, it's everything but the players that we're supposed <laughs> we, to talk We about. got to Dane Dunning, and then we took a hard right turn to Disasterville. I just, wanted, I, I just wanted to point out, Logan Allen, That I'm so happy to see him succeed up here in the majors. I, it's a guy I've been kind of uh, – clamoring for the last few the years real now. logan allen please stand up yeah uh this guy i think his middle name is taylor so logan taylor allen for the cleveland, the cleveland guardians the other logan allen is with another team already so but he used uh, to be in cleveland that that's what makes it so confusing <laughs> and before that he was a padres farmhand that nobody yeah. wanted to be wanted to see traded but jokes on cleveland yeah logan allen, but, this is the logan allen that was actually drafted and developed by cleveland that's right so I'm happy to see him succeed. It looks and everybody's making a big deal about Tanner Bibby, which I also who I also like, but I think Logan Allen might be saying something. G- give uh, me about the Bibby action. Staying. Give me the Bibby action all the way. And of course, yeah. and they still have Gavin Williams to come up too. Like this. That's is, right. It's just an absurd amount of talent that they have over there in Cleveland. Let's see who do I have any other Guardian pitchers besides those three? The Espinos, the Bibbies. Um uh i have oh, the, the lefty oh uh the, there there should be a lefty he's like baby kershaw well it doesn't matter because those were the only three guys i had oh, on my list here boo. yeah well i can't name everybody sean I, I don't even have kevin williams i can't name everybody not everybody's gonna be called up and succeed and anyway yeah if you list all the names level this guy's at because i'm, I'm uh god uh, tuki tussant's also with the guardians luis oh, oviedo okay. is also with the guardians huh Connor Pilkington DFA. Never mind. Anyway, <laughs> my guy, my starting pitcher, my pitcher to click this week is uh, let's uh, let's go with Bailey Ober since you're picking a guy who hasn't had any starting much starting pitching info or usage this year. Usage. Thank you. In 2023, I'll go with Bailey Ober who just got called up because Twins surprise surprise slew of injuries. Tyler <laughs> Molly's hurt. Um, uh, it's not Kodai Sanga. Kenta Maeda. Kenta Maeda. <laughs> <laughs> Kenta Maeda is hurt. So now I swear get... I don't view them all as the same person. <laughs> yeah, that'd be racist if you Sean good job. Uh Bailey Over, still 27 years old. Uh two starts. Uh has uh what is it? Oh, just a plain two to one ratio. But this is a guy that we like the last Yeah, we, we've been liked... talking about him for a long time. And it was definitely... a shame that he was on the outside of the rotation looking in this year. Because yeah. really, like based on what he did last year, he he should have been in the opening day rotation. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree with that sentiment. Uh, it's a guy that I've been keeping an eye on. I drafted uh, almost on all my leagues last year with very mixed reviews. When he's out there, he he pitched spectacularly with great control, but otherwise he's he was hurt most of the time. But so far, um, what what uh, what was I going to do? He's doing it with uh, guile and craftiness and just typical Minnesota Twins pitcher. Has a 10.7 swinging strike percentage. So despite the lack of stuff, he is inducing some swings, well, it, unwanted it's just, swings. Yeah, yeah, it's that great fastball up in the zone that even though it's only 91, 92, uh, he gets really good extension mm-hmm. and it just plays up. And he he's able to command it well up in the zone. I mean, it's he he's able to throw for a strike. He's able to raise it up a little bit higher to get it out of the zone against swings and misses. And he's really developed that slider. That slider is getting more whiffs this year than it has in his entire career. His his whiff percentage on a slider has actually gone up every year in the major leagues. So really developing those secondary pitches. Um, and it's one of those, uh, the guy who just pitches to what the game, with all the low ball hitting and trying to get the ball in the air and pull it, 
uh, his style and the fact, you know, he's so tall, he's six, nine and he gets great extension that 91, 92 looks more like 95, 96 up, yeah. placed well up in the zone. Uh, so it's, uh, you can't let the, the stuff factor fool you on Bailey over. Cause it's, yeah. it's definitely nastier than you would expect. Yeah, he's built like a lineman or maybe a power forward, which I'm sure Jacob, who just uh, – thanks for the sh- a birthday shout-out, Jacob. He uh, – the basketball podcast uh, would appreciate a, a basketball player playing baseball. So that's and really it's, over. Go it's ahead. so funny because I'm seeing that he's listed at 6'9", 260. But it's like when you see him on the mound, you're like, the dude's a pencil. There's no way he weighs 260 pounds. But I guess when you're six foot nine, it kind of just – works out that way i think that's what it is <laughs> all right let's quickly move on to joey lucchese of the new york mets he's 30 years old for another former padres pitcher right uh lefty right yes uh the churve a, i'm sorry what was that the, the churve you know, that's his specialty pitch no oh, right his, uh <laughs> the, the change up grip but throws it like a curveball or curveball grip throws it like a change up I don't know. Well, he uh, of the four guys we listed here, I mean, Dunning isn't listed because he hasn't started a game, but I guess the three guys that are listed here, uh, Lucchese has the highest strikeout rate at 25.5%. Yep. Uh, the peripherals are pretty mixed. FIP likes him. Sierra does not like him. Other, other than that, uh, he has a pretty healthy, help me with this one, call strike plus whiff. Is that what it's called? Yeah, CSW. Yeah. CSW percentage of 28.6%, which is the highest here. And uh, other things to like about him, uh, he has a barrel rate below 10%, although it's still the highest on this list, but still below 10%. So, And uh, has a location plus of 102, so it's 2% better than average. So that's all these steps in the right directions. What else do you like about Joey Lucchese besides the fact that he plays for the Mets? Yeah, so he he's a guy who, you know, obviously was pitching well for the Mets after they acquired him in 2021. Then he went down with Tommy John, uh, missed the rest of the 2021 season, all of 2022. Uh, and back this year, started off the year in AAA as they kind of got him more set into a, a regular rhythm and rotation rest type system. Uh, gets called up, of course, the Mets. Um, Max Scherzer suspension, Verlander, you have to throw a game. Both are slated to start this week. Um, but Joey Lucchese came up on that West Coast road trip and made his debut back home in front of his family against the Giants through seven scoreless with nine strikeouts um, and was really working. The, once again, he's a guy who the, the fastball, it's nothing special. It's 90 to 92, but really uh, with the herky-jerky delivery, uh, Guys have trouble seeing him the first one or two times they see him in the lineup. It'll be interesting to see if they keep Lucchese in the rotation when Max and Verlander are back. David Peterson was already optioned because they kind of need a fresh arm for the doubleheader tomorrow with their last uh, three games, one being called early and the other two being postponed. They'll play a doubleheader tomorrow. So David Peterson, a member of that rotation, was optioned for an extra bullpen arm. Uh, but I would expect David Peterson to come back up. And at that point, the Mets, once again, kind of have a little bit of a log jam in the rotation. They could either keep David Peterson in AAA and Joey Lucchese holds down the spot. But we'll just have to see right now. I think Lucchese probably has the, the slight inside edge. He's pitched a little bit better in his two starts so far. And uh, once again, he's a guy who none of these guys are aces, but he's pitched well recently for the Mets so if you look back on his 2021 season he had like an ERA of like four and a half but in the previous like or the his last four or five starts he was really getting it going uh pitches well in New York he's got a I think a career ERA of like two and a half pitching in New York so uh just a guy that you might be able to stream uh the Mets have one of the easier schedules coming up for the next like 25 days so if a guy like Joey LaCasey can face off against a team like Detroit or Miami, uh, there could be some valuable streaming uh, value there. All right, let's move on to the next guy. The last pitcher on the list is Tyler Wells of the Baltimore Orioles. So, so beware, it's an Orioles pitcher. Uh, I think we talked about before the show started, there's really nothing to be excited about this guy. Uh, but, you know, I think that wall, that new wall is just doing a lot more than what people are really um, are really reporting there. Because Tyler Wells is nothing to be excited about. You mentioned it. He's just nobody exciting. But I mean, I, I've liked him for a couple of years now. It's just the usage with him was yeah. always kind of all over the place. 
that's the problem, right? But the Orioles seem to have um, a good uh, routine in the rotation as of right now, and they've been able to fit the rookie Grayson Rodriguez in perfectly without stunting his growth. And uh, they're still um, competing hard. They're giving the Red Sox fits. Every time I see the final score of a Red Sox Orioles game, the Orioles are are on top. And right now they're 19 and nine, which is really crazy because this team is just so Sarah plain and tall for some reason, but it, it works. And this uh, next we, start's going to be at Kansas City. That's a, yeah. a pretty valuable streaming start right there. Uh, counterpoint his second start next week is against the Braves. So you take the good with the bad. Hey, so with the Orioles, you take the good with the bad. Oh, he, so he, he is pitching Sunday. Oh, crap. <laughs> yeah. No, not so great. And it's in Atlanta. If it was in, in Baltimore, it'd be a little bit more palatable than that. Jacob Moses says that, yeah, you say easy, Sean, but which means the Mets are going to get smacked <laughs> with their luck. Shh, shh, shh. We don't talk By about the it. way, uh, Yanier, Yanier Cano, the the relief pitcher, I I, uh, I kind of uh, spotlighted this past week. You got a, a shout out from Jeff Passon today. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah he, had a, he had a big tweet from Jeff Passon talking oh. about, you know, how he's gone nine perfect or whatever, no hits allowed. No, it's not perfect because no, he hit perfect. a guy. Uh, no, oh, he hit that, a guy. Oh, whatever. whatever. Per- is it a perfect seat? Is it a perfect game? <laughs> Would it be a perfect game? No. No. <laughs> All right, then. Shut you up. No. Uh, <laughs> uh, no, but Yanir Cano, before we get to back to Tyler, was I want to just mention Yanir Cano because uh, I-, I was looking at him last week to insert him in our in my podcast league. Ultimately, I went with Gavin Jacks, and I'll see if, how Kevin Jacks is doing. Gavin Jacks, sorry. Griffin, Griffin, Griffin Jacks. Griffin, sorry. Who the hell is Gavin Jacks? <laughs> Third time's the charm. Gavin Lux? Am I Gavin Lux, Gavin Lux, maybe? <laughs> I think that's Gavin what Lux, Griffin that. Jacks. So I, uh, I ended up picking Gra- Griffin Jacks, and I'm hoping he did okay. I, mean, I guess he's doing all right. I don't know. We'll, <laughs> we'll find out. He had a, a pretty rough outing against the Royals the other day. He did strike out two guys, though, so that was good. Uh, but I was looking at Yannir Cano, too, and, you know, he has the sink. The sinker and the changeup are in the same location, except that obviously one is faster than the other one. I'm pretty sure that's throwing off a lot of hitters because he doesn't have much of a breaking pitch. Oh, he has that slider, but he doesn't really use it as much as yeah. The, his the is changeup. more of that the sinker changeup. I think that's, yeah, that's really where he's. And a couple of few days later, Fangraphs decides to give an entire article on the guy. I'm like, ah, oh, they're stealing my thunder. And now yeah, you're say, saying he, he's getting a lot of. Uh... A lot of press these days. And then Jeff Passan. And then I also, like I said, the post mentioned how he is uh, a couple outs away from pitching a perfect, no, sorry, a no hitter to start the season, to to start off his first nine seasons, which it looks like he did c- complete that no hitter um, in, in, in nine innings of relief pitching. So big congratulations to Yanir Cano for, uh, and I guess you could say he ended the month of April. I don't know what happened today, but he ended the month of April with a no hitter. Out of yeah. uh, doing relief work, so good uh, for him. They don't think. Uh, I'm trying to look on. Usually, there's a little arrow that. Okay, there it is. Uh, Baltimore played. They won five to three. Let's see if Cano pitched. Do uh, box score. Yainier Cano pitched one and a third innings, struck out two on eleven pitches, four outs on eleven pitches. Jesus Christ! They need they need to find out what season what he's on, right? <laughs> this is not all natural. <laughs> this is video game stuff, man. And usually, when it's video game stuff, it's time to uh, do some more. And testing. it was funny because I, he was a guy that a lot of people mentioned, and I think even us last year because he was involved in that Jose Lopez the uh, Jorge Lopez. Jorge. It's yeah, Jorge we're, Lopez, we're not all, Griffin Jack. We're, we're all just freaking it up now. Um, yeah. But I want to say, like, I remember when we looked at him last year, it was like we looked at the age and the level he was at, and we're like, okay, it, it is what it is. It's a 29-year-old guy in the minors. Uh, cool. I'm telling, listen, man, this is why I get excited during the trade deadline. I know you gave me so much grief about it, but this is why I like talking about these low, low-level low trades that mean nothing, but it could mean something later because yeah. you never know. And yeah. I, and I'm pretty sure I don't know what the Cano's numbers were last year, but I know the article that I read mentioned that how much he was struggling with keeping control and command. It, uh, when he got to Baltimore, yeah, that was that was an issue. When he was in Minnesota to start the year, yeah, uh, he pitched 20 games, 23 innings at an ERA of 1.90. Uh, strikeouts were solid, walks were down, basically at a career low. Uh, but then when he went to Baltimore, there were some initial struggles. 
ERA ballooned over four, walks per nine over four. Uh, but um, he has uh, made it work this year. So, and, and can we add Baltimore as one of those pitching hubs that we always talk about? We always brag about. That, that's Michael Elias. That's a, that's a Houston guy. Oh, that there, explains so. it. That explains it. I'm telling you, that's, that's why I, I trust in this in their build so far. Yeah, let's see. I'm looking at yeah, Cano had just struggling in AAA in 2021 with the five walks per nine innings. Uh, just nah, anyway, getting distracted here. So, anyway, back to Tyler Wells. Yes, he is uh, getting two starts this week. So, if you're playing daily leagues, I would venture to suggest you start Tyler Wells against the Royals this week. Yeah. And then definitely, I'm definitely doing that this week. <laughs> cut him for the Braves. If you play in weekly leagues, it's still an, if you have no one else and you're just streaming uh, pitchers because they do two starts. I'm surprised Tyler Wells is only owned in how many he's owned in 38% of leagues. Bailey yeah, Ober was that, that, at 21%, very by the way. A, like both of those were very shocking to me. I, I was yeah. looking and of course I'm like going down through the list of ownership percentages. And I saw the two guys under 50 and I was like, there's no way it's going to get any worse than this. <laughs> uh, so I didn't even keep going, but yeah, those Wells and Ober, those are two guys I really like. And this year, um, when he first came up in 2021, the Velo was like 95 plus coming out of the bullpen and he was still throwing his entire starters arsenal. There's a, really a lot to like. Um, and then he went to the rotation Last year, the fastball comes down to more like 92, 93, and you start to worry a little bit. But this year, um, the the command of his pitches, he's throwing five pitches, all of them at least um, almost 15% is least thrown as a curveball at 12%. But he's throwing everything, the fastball only about a third of the time, locating it up in the zone well. His changeup is getting almost like a foot and a half of horizontal movement. So really being able to keep lefties in check with that changeup going down and away from lefties, uh, keeping the, the slider into lefties. And he's done really well. So it's a really kind of a, a boring profile. Uh, I'd really hope, wish his velo would go back to like 95 plus, then he'd be like a really exciting guy. But at this point, I mean, he's his top four pitches, the highest opponents are batting against any of them. Is 211 against his cutter. They're batting 129 against his four seam, 172 against the changeup, and 200 against his slider. Uh, nothing crazy in terms of whiff rates. They're all sub 30%, but it's just one of those perfectly sequencing and commanding well can take you really, really far. And throwing strikes. He's got one of the best walk rates uh, in the majors this year uh, with only a 2.9% walk rate. So. Throw strikes, command it in the zone, mix up your pitches, boom. That's it's a pretty good recipe for success. Wells is doing well. Yeah, he has the lowest uh, walk percentage of all, of anyone on this list. Uh, it's only three people on this list, but still. Uh, the ERA peripherals are kind of sketchy on him, but they're sketchy on all the guys that we mentioned. So Yeah, he, he's got a, a 3.14 expected ERA based on, uh, you know, the batted balls against him. Like I said, he gives up probably a little bit more hard contact, but he's giving up a lot of uh, – he's really pitching to his strengths in that in Baltimore. If you look at the average launch angles against him, it's a lot of fly balls. I want to say the actual fly ball percent was – if I can find it. If you see it, yell it out because I cannot find it right now. Sure. Let's see who gets there first. Uh, fly ball, 38%. It's a pretty high fly ball percentage. Only a 33% ground ball percent. So um, uh, what what numbers are you looking? Are you looking at like stack I'm, I'm, I'm on I'm on yeah Stackcast. Oh okay, it's yeah stack, the Stackcast and Fangraphs kind of differ on batted ball profiles. Well, the guys that we talked, my guys that I talked about, Ober and Wells have a fly ball percentage well over fifty percent. Well, not yeah, well. Over, Ober's but, a, Ober's a big fly ball guy. Yeah, so is Wells, which yeah. I thought I read that he does the a lot on fly balls as well. So uh, plus, plus, I'm also looking at starting pitching performance only so if wells was on the bullpen earlier this season then it's those numbers are not going to show uh he started four games yeah because he came in relief he uh went okay he had had like six innings of relief in his first game and all yeah that explains it five into uh no five innings out of the bullpen no hits two strikeouts yeah that was his season debut against the rangers i can't remember why that exactly happened but as mentioned before bailey over 21 percent available so uh, yeah, that should not Grab be him. that should not be a thing <laughs> and tyler wells 38 percent. and uh, just to finish up my tyler wells spiel uh 
I, he's inducing the most swing percentages out of anybody on this list. Lowest outside the strike zone contact rate. You know how I like that stat. Yeah, that means you, you can't make contact with his pitches outside the strike zone, then you're screwed. At least that's how I view it. And um, yeah, barrel uh, has the highest stuff plus at 93 and also has the highest location and pitching plus well over 105 for both of those categories. So those are the starters that we're going with. Let's go over to the bullpen. You're going with an old favorite of ours. Well, yeah, I guess you could say old favorite. Yeah. And this guy caused a lot of controversy in the baseball life league. But it's Nate Pearson, <laughs> former starting pitching Blue Jays Uber prospect, who is now relegated to bullpen duties as we yeah, transition over to relief pitchers. Yeah, he, here. he's a relief pitcher. That's uh, uh, I mean, he's still only 26. I guess you could always hold out hope that maybe he gets stretched out. Maybe not this year. Maybe next year or something, but uh, right now he is solidly in the bullpen. Just recently got called up, was off on a tear in the minor leagues to start the year. Uh, pitched in eight games, uh, in eight and a third inning, struck out 16. That's uh, always nice. And uh, instantly comes up to that bullpen and becomes a, a pretty important part, uh, I would think, to that Blue Jays bullpen. Basically, him, Eric Swanson acquired in the Teoscar Hernandez trade, and closer Jordan Romano. And I don't think a whole lot has to happen for Nate Pearson to really jump past any of those guys. I'm not saying he's going to take the closer job from Jordan Romano, but Jordan Romano's 30. I mean, relief pitchers are fickle. Anything can happen. And if that were the case, Nate Pearson has the stuff the mentality and the pedigree to really be an elite closer. And I think this was a possibility even when he was a top time Uber prospect, everyone was saying uh, worst case scenario is he's a 30 save a season closer. So mm. um, very interesting to see him back up and to see him do well, the fastball velo in his first, he's pitched one game so far since being called up average, like 98, 99 uh, throwing, I think slider change up slider curveball, something like that. So okay. uh, still keeping three pitches. Uh, which is, you know, oh, slightly above average for a reliever. But when you think about his pass as a starter, it uh, it makes sense. Pick up mentioning, if we're talking about relievers, uh, I want to just give a shout-out to Mason Thompson. I believe he plays for the Nationals, right? He's also yes, had a great season so far. he had a solid so three-inning save against the Mets where he looked absolutely nasty. Yeah. And then he gets one day off and Davey Martinez brought him back. And the guy had just thrown like 50 something pitches in relief Jeez. to get it. And um, even Ron Darling, in the, when the, they saw him come out, Ron was like, This is kind of frightening. Like, you know, <laughs> and the, the guy, Mason Thompson, <laughs> normally throws really hard. And he came out to pitch again in that series. And he was, Velo was down like two and a half miles an hour. And he just got absolutely rocked. And uh, so, yeah, but that, he he looked really impressive in that three inning save against the Mets. I was like, holy hell! <laughs> yeah, twenty eight pitches on Tuesday, for April twenty fifth, and then two days later comes back on April twenty seventh, Thursday, with sixteen pitches. It looks like a blown save and a loss. So way to go, Mason, uh, Davey Martinez. But other than that, he looks like he's the sixth inning guy behind C.J. Edwards and Hunter Harvey before Kyle Finnegan. Yeah, I think the they closers. would really. I, I think Hunter Harvey's going to take. Uh, Harvey might be too good to be the just pure closer for Davey Martinez, but he was a guy that when he came in, he got, I think, uh, CJ Edwards like loaded up the bases and Hunter Harvey came out and got three strikeouts, got out of the inning. Yeah. And, Mason uh, Thompson giving up a 1.4% walk rate. That's just absurd. Real absurd. But anyway, let's go over to my guy, my relief pitcher, owned in 33% of CBS uh, Sports Fantasy Baseball Leagues, Brian Abreu, last year's uh, World Series darling, who just came in and just it seemed like he was just shutting the door on the Phillies every time he was summoned from the bullpen, getting off to another great start. But you're gonna, probably going to mention, or not you, Sean, but people in general, general are probably going to mention that Brian Abreu is not the closer. It's Ryan Presley. But hey, if you're in a league like ours where it's crazy, well, if you're in a league like ours, odds are Brian Abreu is gone. But for those who yeah. are into what do you call it, uh, prospecting for saves as the season goes on, uh, Brian Abreu, for me, fits the profile of a closer than Brian Presley does. Uh, and so far, he has two saves along with three holds. So if you're in a holds league, you should probably go pick him up if he is available because uh, that might increase. 
42.9% strikeout rate, Sean, which is absurd, yeah. uh, even for a relief pitcher. That's still a crazy high number. Uh, the peripherals love him. Uh, just inducing a, a high amount of swinging percentage outside the strike zone at 35%. Doesn't give up much contact, just strikes after st- the whole, This whole thing is just strike, 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 strike. Stuff plus of 133. Location yeah. 95, though. So, yeah, yeah his, his fastball um, gets hit. It's, it's high octane, uh, but it's gotten hit pretty consistently, even going back uh, the last couple of years. Uh, but that slider this year is just doing, I mean, he's throwing it 50% of the time. They're whiffing, batters are whiffing 50% of the time when they do swing at it, batting 045 against it. Uh, only one hit allowed, and it was a single. 13 strikeouts. It's an absurd pitch. Uh, Throwing the curveball a little bit more this year as well. Uh, getting good results out of it. It's just, uh, yeah, I mean, you, you would think with a guy that throws as hard as he does, the fastball would perform a little bit better, but alas, he'll just have to rely on an absolutely elite level slider. All right, well, let's move on to the hitters now. Uh, you have Blake Sable. You you were in charge of finding a catcher for yeah, us. Yeah, I feel like I got shafted here because I had to, really? the, two, the two hardest positions to find, I think, in baseball this year is catching and middle infielder. I thought I you like, would like to – I honestly I, I, like I, 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 I do like the challenge. I do like the challenge. But when I saw that, I was like, oh, my God, middle infield sucks. Catching sucks. This all sucks. I, <laughs> I thought that was your thing to get those yeah, guys. It, it, like, is, it, is, it is. It is. It is. It is. But I was just like, whoa, this is the – the hard part of the homework. <laughs> I'm surprised they didn't go after Shea Langoliers. He's at 46%. Jan Gomes at 20% over at CBS. Well, it's funny because right now in the Baseball Life League, I believe my two starting catchers are who you just mentioned, Shea, uh, Shea Langoliers, and the guy who I picked, which was uh, Blake Sable. So, yeah, boom, there you go. I don't yeah. care about batting average, apparently. <laughs> Danny Jansen is also available in a lot of uh, – uh, is, he under, is he under 50%? 34%. Gabriel wow. Moreno is exactly at 50%. I'm Christian surprised Be- Moreno's not starting more. I mean, he's, he's starting yeah. well, uh, own more. He's starting in Arizona. So Really? I did not know that. I thought he was still splitting time over there. Uh, Christian Betancourt. Well, Carson at- Kelly was hurt. Who would he be platooning with? Oh, I don't let know. Me, let, that- let me look. Oh. Christian Betancourt is 27%, by the way. So uh, the highest on the list here, I'm, I'm looking at it, Jonah Heim, 82%. Yeah. Uh, has seen an increase in ownership rate in the last since the last week. So anyway, yeah, he he's hit a couple of home runs. Hit a home run today against the Yankees. So uh, who's that? I'm sorry, Greg uh, Moreno. Heim. Oh, John Jonah Heim. That'll do it. Well, anyway, Blake Sable. I know you've mentioned him before. Let me just uh, spew out some numbers. Uh, Forty-three point one percent strikeout rate. You're off to a bad start here, Sean. So it yeah, be it's not my argument. favorite part about him. It's not my favorite part about him. <laughs> Two stolen bases though. Yep. Five home runs. So I, I see why. I see where the method is. I see where the madness is coming from now. Uh, what else we got? Uh, let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Oh, very aggressive swinger. 48.8% swinging percentage. Doesn't make a lot of contact. So but when he does make contact, apparently he knocks it out of the ballpark. Highest uh, call strike plus whiff percentage at 34.7% of the four hitters that we're going to talk about today. And how's the stack as numbers? 12.5% barrel rate. Okay, that'll that'll fly. Literally, it'll fly <laughs> out of the ballpark. And a 43.8%. Hard hit rate according to StatCast, which I guess for a catcher is pretty high. Uh, so, again, this is the second time you mentioned Blake Sable. What new thing you got for me for Blake Sable? Yeah, so today? when we talked about him the first time, it was he was having a, a great spring training. He was probably one of the best hitters in spring training this year. Um, and it was the fact that, one, lefty, love it. Two, he played not only catcher, but he also played some outfield, which he's done so far this year as well. And there was a little bit of uh, speed to his game. Uh, he had he stole 10 bases last year in the minor leagues and put up really good numbers. The, the strikeout rate was a little bit high between double A AA and triple A, usually bouncing between 21, 25 percent, uh, which at the major league level wouldn't be bad. But when you translate that to the major league level, it usually means you're talking high 20s, low 30s at best. Uh, this year, I was not expecting a 43 percent strikeout rate. But with all the injuries they had behind the plate, Roberto Perez went down early. Joey yeah. Bart went down early, but is now back. I think Blake, you're going to see Blake Sable uh, falling into the strong side of a platoon. Joey Bart is off to a good start, uh, but we know he has his own swing and miss issues. Mm-hmm. And so far this year, yeah, 
against right-handed pitching, uh, which is 53 of uh, Sable's 65 plate appearances. He's batted 260 with a 302 on base. Not great, but a five, he's slugging 560 against right-handed pitching, 131 WRC plus. And like you said, he's just really hitting the ball hard. Uh, five home runs places him uh, tied for second and most home runs by a catcher. Uh, honestly, the uh, there's one other name on this list that I would not expect to be here, and that was Young Gomes. And Young Gomes is sub 50% owned off to a great start. He, he already has five home runs, which has to be like matches total for the last five years, it feels like. But he's batting 313. So Young Gomes is another guy. If you, you don't want Blake Sable, you want somebody who makes a little bit more contact, uh, pick uh, Young Gomes. But Blake Sable, I'm, I'm really expecting a little bit of a, a return to the average here. I, I think he's going to be around that slugging. Maybe the uh, on base isn't as high as it was going to be in the minors, but uh, he did walk a good bit in the minors. So it's, it's a little shocking. Um, he was always around 10, 12, 13%. Uh, in AAA last year, uh, he got end of the year there. He walked 17% of the time. So uh, there's, I think, a little bit more room for that walk, those walks and strikeouts to balance out. And uh, if you're going to have probably 20 home run, 10 stolen base upside at catcher, I'll take it. All right. My guy is Jaron Duran. Um, Duran, ooh. Duran. Team Mexico. Yeah, we actually do have two Durants to talk about today. Duran, Duran. That should be the name of the episode, by the way. Oh, Durant, yeah, Durant. that's a good one. Yeah. So, Jaron Duran, Team Mexico, uh, came off the bench mostly and maybe maybe made a couple of starts for Alec Thomas in center field. Um, but already has two stolen bases in 12 games so far uh, and a one home run. I, I, I will like one home run as well. I would like to see a higher walk rate and a lower strikeout rate, but that's fine. He's, you know, I'm hopefully he'll, that'll work itself out as the season progresses. Getting off to a great start since we, he was called up again from the Boston Red Sox this year. Um, showing some patience at the plate. Contact rate of 81.3% is the highest of anyone on this list of four players. So uh, limits is uh, swinging strikes, has the lowest amount of uh, call strike plus whiff rate. And uh, let's see, 14.7 barrel rate, which I like. 58.8% hard hit rate. Again, it's still... Uh, it's, a, it's, it's 50 point appearances. <laughs> yeah, that's right. It's, limit, it's limited time, but he's been starting every day since getting called up, usually batting yeah, at the I bottom of the order. They said something is up with uh, uh, Kike Hernandez, uh, and then somebody else was hurt. Because I was also looking at Emmanuel Valdez as one of my uh, for middle infield, but went another direction. So that makes sense that Duran might be playing more if Kike is out, who's been playing a lot of the center field. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's like an older team too. So just to see, uh, well, yeah, yeah, it's a speaking. really weird. It's a it's a weird mix of really young guys, really old guys. Yeah. I feel like there's nobody that's just like like Rafael Devers might be the most middle aged guy in the lineup. <laughs> Yeah, well, I guess mode or, or go. Yeah, like, yeah, uh, yeah. You still got Justin Turner, who really puts it up on the uh, skews the average a little bit on the age, and Kike Hernandez, you mentioned, who is injured. Reese McGuire, twenty eight years old. Uh, Rob Ruff Snyder, and the bench is thirty two. Uh, we, we're going to talk about the Rockies soon, but former wait, R- Rymel Tapia was he a former Rocky? Or am I think I was. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Look at that. Okay, twenty nine years old. Oh, he, Tapia is only 29. I'm looking yeah, at I it. I feel like yeah. he's been around forever. Well, I mean, there's a lot of guys who feel like they've been around forever. Christian Arroyo is starting on this team. Oh, yeah. And he former, looks like he's been around forever, but he's only a raised guy. He's about to be 28 years old. So it's a lot of, uh, you know, that those the old, oh, well, all these guys are on their peak. So that means they're going to be good, right? Well, no, they suck. <laughs> Well, actually, they have a winning record, 15-14. Yeah, they really got to do something about these stupid divisions, seriously. <laughs> anyway, that's another show for another topic, another day. But anyway, uh, so Jaron Duran, I know that it's still uh, a small sample size, but there's a lot to like here. He is naturally fast. Yeah. He looks like a guy who can make a, a, a high amounts of contact rate. So I am definitely all aboard the Jaron Duran. Mm-hmm. If I had the space to get him, I would definitely yeah. go for it. You see, that's my thing is in the baseball life league right now is – like Cody Bellinger and Miles Straw have just been sitting on my bench because wow. I have no room to play them because uh, it's Carroll, Nimmo, Tucker, and Alvarez. And I've had to utilize Alvarez. And when 
Otani is not pitching, like, I, I try to you tell him. And that means like I got to sit Corbin Carroll or <laughs> Jordan Alvarez. And I'm like, oh my God, this sucks. But, Some, uh, they're always asking who needs pitching. I think you would qualify there. Yeah. So I, I have the most strikeouts of any team. I was looking at it right before we went live. Pitching strikeouts? Uh, yes. Pitching strikeouts. I have the most pitching strikeouts, but I have the worst on base percentage against. Oh, yeah, and like the second it. to lowest, well, uh, second to second to last in whip, I think. But uh, yeah. just to throw a little cold water in Jordan Ren, I do like him personally. I was kind of shocked that he struggled as much as he had uh, in his two first, you know, in 2021 and 2022. He's got like a combined uh, 330, 350 plate appearances, um, hitting 215 and 221 with a Babbitt between 300 and 320. Uh, just to put that in perspective, so far this year he's batting 409 with a 515 BABIP. Uh, so maybe there's a little bit of shift reduction averaging out there, but he does have a 310 expected batting average. So um, somewhat believable so far. Uh, it's not a, anything fluky. So uh, maybe Jaron Duran's getting ready to break out. Who knows? All right. Well, We'll see. Again, uh, temper expectations, but there's a lot to like here. He's always been a super fast guy to begin with, and th- 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 you could find some um, some value in fantasy leagues as well, especially in leagues like ours where we do account for a batting average and on base. I think he can fit those two categories very well. Okay. Uh, let's uh, see here. Uh, speaking of Duran, Ezekiel Duran. Yep. Oh, you know what? I was confusing this. You Ezekiel. thought it was Ezekiel Tovar? Yeah, because yeah. he's been sucking too. But yeah. I remember we the other Ezekiel. <laughs> but Ezekiel Duran is another guy that we he talked about. He was the about. Yankees prospect. Yeah, yeah I know he was, we mentioned uh, Joey, him. Joey Gallo trade. Right? We mentioned him before as well. I think that's where it was. But Ezekiel, I remember Ezekiel Duran. Uh, what do we have here? A 1.6 walk rate. Wow, Sean, that's not very likely, yeah, Sean. Yeah, no, well, the middle infield's a shit show. I've told you this. That was have gone uh, after Rodolfo Castro. Uh, you, I almost picked Rodolfo Castro, but then you would have had to pick somebody else, and maybe you would have picked Ezekiel Duran. No, I, there's no way in God's no. <laughs> Let's see. Let, let, you know what? You bring up an interesting point. What, who, what other hitters? Let's see. What other, let's just go with second baseman just to get this out of the way. Uh, let's see. There's Mauricio Duvon. No, I wouldn't have gone with him. There's Taylor Walls. Oh, G1 Bay. There you go. I would have gone with G1 Bay. G1 so Bay is I, starting to lose. No, he's starting to lose his job. To uh, t- t- Tukapita Marcano has got called up and has That's started stupid. to play more and more against right-handed pitching because uh, Bay kind of started to struggle. Well, I still believe in Bay. Bay's Bay, man. <laughs> uh, yeah, I've been starting him over Luis Robert because apparently Robert only wants to play hard when he feels 100%. Oh, God. I, what was I, the I, reason? I, so it was the first inning yesterday. And uh, he hit this little nubber that just got past the third base side of the mound. And the pitcher was the only one that was going to be able to have a play on it. Mm-hmm. And uh, he got to it and did like this really, you know, pitchers awkward, really awkward pitchers are, in general. Well, loopy no, he like, he like, loopy spiked. Throw. I think he spiked it, but it was not no. thrown. It was not thrown hard. I, I can swear. I, saw, I, I thought the ball bounced. Maybe it, it didn't lo- bounce. I thought it looked. It was really, it, it was soft. It was soft, but it was I, a soft I even, throw. Yeah. I don't even think it reached the first baseman. I think it did. But if he had been running even like just normal run it out to first base, he would have been safe. But it, he was going like Robinson Cano, <laughs> Carlos Beltran at 38 years old to first base. And <laughs> yeah, he, he got, and he got pulled. Yeah, he and, got it's, pulled, yeah. and it's so funny because like I, I know a lot of Mets fans used to give Beltron like tremendous amounts of shit, even when he was in his prime, because he wouldn't run hard to first base all the time. But it was like one of those things where it's like, okay, well, when your guy is like the best player on the team and he doesn't want to get hurt, like I get there's times, but when you hit a little nubber like that, you gotta run hard. Like yeah. if you hit like a, a routine ground ball to second base, like okay, jog it out, whatever. But if you if you have a, the speed of Luis Robert and you hit a number like that, you gotta run. Like I mean, it's pitchers are awkward. Most of them can't even throw to first base. Like just run. <laughs> that was very disappointing to see. And he's been benched on my baseball life league for a long time now <laughs> in favor of G1 Bay. Uh, because G1 Bay is just stealing everything. I mean, they're, they're gonna arrest him. Is he up to this year? Last I checked, he was at 10. Oh, geez. Which for me, this early in the season is a lot for me. Yeah, well, th- this is a, a whole new world that we're in. In terms, I understand of that, base. but tra- still, traditionally speaking, for my team, 
getting a guy with 10 stolen bases after yeah, one month that is a rarity that, 10 stolen I, I usually, bases only caught once yeah no he, he's uh he's he's a thief man he's gonna do five to ten years just like uh felipe vasquez <laughs> but <laughs> No, hey, I'm ben, looking... Bay, Bay was in trouble on his own in his own career. I'm, All right. I, I didn't know about that, but I, I found out about it on Twitter. There was another guy from the Pittsburgh Pirates, Korean player, too. Uh, he yeah, also did, got in trouble. Yeah, did both Bay, you know, Bay's Korean, too. <laughs> yeah, I'm, it's, it's a pattern. It's a pattern. Uh, I made a joke yeah, about it in the, two, in the chat. Two different uh, types of trouble between the two Koreans, So Yeah, I think, he, uh, was it Kang, right? That was his yeah, last Jung, name? Jung Ho Kang. Uh, Jung, Jung Ho yeah, Jung, yeah. Kong, King, he, he, whatever. He was the big power shortstop. Yep. Second baseman. And uh, he got in trouble in Chicago, too. So In Chicago? He never played in Chicago. No, no, he got in trouble in Chicago. Yeah, oh. That's where he got in trouble. Yeah. And then he, uh, got, in, then he got sent back to Korea, got in trouble again over there. That's and right. Yeah, he, so. he, he can't enter the U.S. So, But like I always say, I don't always like Korean players, but when I do, they usually play for the Pittsburgh Pirates. <laughs> this is what he said. Today, Luis Robert, today my legs were a little tired. My legs were tired. My right hamstring was a little tight. Then I decided just to play conservative to play today. God, so there you really, go. Oh, he's down to no, 213 on the It's year. bad. Oh. And, and the White Sox, they won today, so they snapped a 10-game losing streak. But still, it, this is a, it's a complete you-know-what show. <laughs> um, they, they, they're obviously... At least they're healthy. <laughs> This is them healthy. Yeah. Jesus. There was another one like he said, it had, well, I'm, you know, my hamstring's a little tight, but I know that if I would have said that my hamstring was bothering me, I wouldn't have played then. But you still are not even playing. Not even playing. <laughs> I think the, the craziest part about that was that was like the what? The first inning he was leading off the game. And like he just immediately, like, you're out of here. Like, you go. You're done. Good. Uh... Bum. But yeah. And now White Sox fans are like, oh, man, how can you let this? You know what, Sean? I don't feel sorry for them because I did warn them about them time and time again. And you know what they told me? Whatever, Cub fans, shut up. Why don't you switch out of that White Sox and put on your Cubs hat like you always do? Because I do root for both teams because, you know, double the pleasure, double the fun. Right, Sean? <laughs> and um, and I did warn them. No, they're not. This is not because they were comparing it to, oh, this is uh, the, our rise. The White Sox rise just like the Cubs rose in 2015, 2016. And then went on that window. Oh, okay, uh, I lied. So window. Tim Anderson and Yoan Moncada are not in the lineup, so they're not completely healthy. That's, yeah, that's, yeah, relatively, that's what I thought. relatively. Yeah, one guy, one guy gets healthy, quote unquote healthy, because even though he plays conservatively, and then you got two or three guys who get hurt. But I told him like this is not the same thing, you guys. This is completely different. Yes, you do have Uber prospects, but you are there's a lot of missing pieces here. And then this is a White Sox team that doesn't. Unlike the Cubs, White Sox always whiff on the on the big name free agents. They yeah. don't get the free agents that they want, so then they settle for a bunch of bums, a yeah. bunch of low level free agents. You, you give wants. Uh, Andrew Benintendi eighty million dollars. <laughs> yeah. Which, oh well. <laughs> Isn't that like the richest contract they've ever given out to? It's really pathetic. That, it's like really that's pathetic. really like because there was somebody posted in Baseball Life the three teams that haven't given a hundred million dollar contract yet. It was the White Sox, I think A's. Yeah. And the Royals, maybe sounds right. Yeah, but yeah, um, you know, uh, well, well, the White Sox are a small market team. That's why. <laughs> I, well, I mean, we can go on and on about how putrid of a franchise the White Sox are. This is unacceptable. This is you're you're the largest city in the whole division. Now I get it. You got to share the market with the Chicago Cubs, but I don't want. I mean, we're done with excuses, man. You should be bullying the crap out of it. Instead, you get outclassed by the Guardians and the Twins in terms of player development. And you're getting um, outspent by the Twins. I mean, they go out and get Carlos Correa. The White Sox, what? They get Andrew Benintendi, which at that point it seemed like a guy that we did need. But at the same time, there's a lot of holes everywhere. We talked about it time and time again for the last two, three, two or three years. So there's lack of starting pitching depth. The bullpen uh, might have been the one saving grace. But there's also lack of depth on the bench. We're lo- you're depending on guys like Lurie Garcia to get you from game to game to game because you know you're going to get hurt. You trusted on Nick Madrigal when he wasn't ready. You should have gone after a guy like Jonathan Scope to at least give Madrigal a chance to kind of – well, either way, Madrigal got hurt anyway. So there's another thing, Sean. There is something in that training staff that is causing these injuries time and time and time and time again, and you can't develop any minor leaguers. You don't have any of your own top 100 prospects anywhere to be found. A lot of those guys that they have are are, are from trades. Anyway, I don't want to – I don't want to talk. The about one thing I will bring up, and I, I'm not to rub it in or anything. You are rubbing but, it in. That's what you remember, do best. Remember last year when they called up um, Lenin or Lenin? <laughs> I don't want to call him Lenin. Like Lenin Sosa, yeah. Yeah. 
uh, and everyone was like, there was like, I'd never even heard of the guy really. And then there was all this hype that, oh, he's getting promoted, blah, 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 blah. He's in a, you know what he is for his major league career so far through 80, yeah, 85 plate appearances. Bad. <laughs> he's hitting 120 with a 141 on base in a 229 slug, 2.4% walk percentage, 27% strikeout rate, negative six WRC plus for his career. And I saw that he was starting at second base and somebody was talking about like how bad he's been this year. And I was like, oh, that, that's real bad. <laughs> that's real bad. <laughs> and it's like, how is that guy starting on a team that's supposed to be contending? Uh, it just it made no sense to me. <laughs> I'm I, was looking like, for that's, the... I was like, that's bad. That's really bad. I'm I'm struggling to find the quote where, where Robert was saying like, well, I didn't really hustle because if I would have told him I was hurt, then I wouldn't be playing. Something It was something stupid to that effect. Uh. And I can't find the exact quote now that I need it. But anyway, Robert didn't want to get hurt. He was hurt, but he didn't want the team to know that he was hurt because he wanted to play. And then he didn't want to play. So and then he didn't want to play. I you mean, say you want to play. Why don't you play? <laughs> but yeah, the lack of hustle says otherwise, right? So anyway, very disappointing. It looks like you won that trade after all between Jerry Kalenic, Nick Well, it's funny because I don't even have Kalenic anymore. <laughs> Well, uh, either way, I mean, it's better than keeping loose Robert on your In terms of reason, uh, right? process, in terms of process, I won the trade. Sure. It's funny. I did acquire him in the 30 team that I've been doing for four years now. And I had to give up David Bednar and Vaughn Brown, top prospect for the Giants. And I was really starting to kick myself because then Diaz got hurt. I'd also traded Jansen and Robertson, two other closers. And I was like, Crap, I, I only have like two closures now. I have like Bautista and Alexis Diaz. That's it. And uh I was like, God damn, I really wish I had David Bednar back. Like Clinic <laughs> probably isn't gonna even start for me. And then in the last like two and a half weeks, I've just been like, Praise God. <laughs> <laughs> Especially now with like Judge potentially being hurt. And I'm like, oh God, I'm glad I have a like a highly productive outfield still. I finally found the uh, Joey Ortiz, maybe I would have been my other middle infielder then oh he, he just got sent back down he got sent back down but i would have been like hey keep an eye on this guy I, we talked about him a couple uh, the last time we were on that, that it's a miracle that jorge mateo is still producing even though the orioles have options in the minors and joey ortiz is one of those guys and he got off to a pretty good start to uh, uh to his career so far anyway uh so ezekiel duran are we done with him who are we talking well, about i don't think we barely even talked about it yeah, why the hell did we talk about Luis uh, anyway uh, ezekiel you know, we went to g1 bay and then we somehow got from g1 bay to the white Sox. yeah somehow oh because Ch- chicago is full of anyway uh duran's the most aggressive hitter on this list of four players 54.9 percent swing swinging percentage along with uh you know, ironically enough, he also has a healthy, decent contact rate. So I guess swing at everything and you'll eventually hit something is the method to the madness here. Other than that, uh, why should we care about Ezekiel Duran? So Corey Seager's hurt. Went down with a somewhat severe hamstring strain out till probably June. I think they said late May, early June. Uh, the Rangers, in terms of filling that void, turned to a platoon of Ezekiel Duran and Josh H. Smith. Uh, Josh H. Smith, being the lefty, was on the strong side of the platoon. Uh, wasn't really doing much, though. Uh, Ezekiel Duran so far lately has almost taken that job completely. Uh, 50% hard hit rate, as you said, uh, batting 310 so far this year. And the he's never walked a whole lot in the minor leagues. His career high was like, as a Yankee, back before he got traded, he was around 9% but never higher than 7% uh, as a Texas Ranger farmhand. So I wouldn't expect that to go up too high, but he does seem to have a legitimate bat-to-ball skill in terms of hitting, you know, line drives, hitting the ball somewhat hard, Uh, always been a pretty good line drive hitter. And if he has the starting shortstop job for the Texas Rangers team that's doing pretty well, I don't think he's going to be batting in the top third of the lineup, but maybe he could work his way to 6-ish, 7-ish. and he plays on a good team. So uh, the kind of the same reason with Dane Dunning. It feels so weird to be saying like, oh, he plays on a good team. And we're talking about a team in the AL West that is not the Astros. So uh, yeah, I, I think by the time it's all said and done, they're going to switch positions. We'll, we'll, the, the Astros will be up and up on the up and up again. And the Rangers will uh, 
Yeah, well, I mean, it's, it's, it's very possible. It's very possible. Uh, yeah, that I like AL, those chances. ALS right now is all very all within like a game and a half of uh, the top three teams. So right. ironically, the Mariners are not one of those three teams that are within a game and a half. So I don't think many of us had that on our uh, fans cards for this year. Let's see here. Uh, I see that Leon has tightened the uh, has uh, erased some of the deficit. Uh-oh. I was up like eighteen to six in our baseball IF league. Now I'm up only thirteen to ten. So uh, stop the count. Stop, stop the count. I, I I need this win. I need all the wins. I want all <laughs> the wins. And then so I could choke in the playoffs, and everybody can make fun of me that I don't know what to do, that I don't know what I'm doing, or anything like that. Thirty wins is not is not impressive enough, apparently, Sean. Well, I guess uh, thirty wins a season, which Looks like our guy James Henlebo is not gonna is not gonna go for that that win record anymore, is he? <laughs> now with his putrid start, man. See, he he was bragging last year that he. Uh, I think he was insinuating that the protege has become the master. Nah, let's 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 skip this. Nah, I have the platform for it. Yeah, so let, hold your horses, young man. Let's hold the horses, young man. Last guy we're going to talk about is Rodolfo Castro. See, the, and, and I've been keeping an eye on Rodolfo Castro for the Pittsburgh Pirates for a while because there. Yeah, you mentioned it uh, at the beginning of or, or around spring training. I was getting ready to get G1 Bay to be called up by the Pirates, right? So I was excited about that. And then I see reports that, hey, hold on a minute there, young buck. Um, well, I'm not young anymore, but I'm 40. But I'm a man. I'm, I'm a man. 40. I hope you can say that. I can say that. And it'll be true. I'm a man. I'm 40. I'm surprised I didn't me. say that earlier. I'm honestly surprised I didn't get to that earlier. Yeah. <laughs> Well, it's, it's, it's later, uh, better late than never, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. So, But I would keep it on Castro, Rodolfo Castro of the Pirates, is because uh, he was the main competition for G1 Bay out of spring training. And uh, now that O'Neill Cruz got hurt, it looks like Castro was able to get some of that playing time. And now he qualifies everywhere, shortstop, second base, third base. So it's a guy now that I really want, but do I trust him? Enough to pick him up. But here, here's what he's been doing so far. And he, again, uh, I, didn't, I don't know if I mentioned this, but Jaron Duran was a 41% ownership rate. Rodolfo Castro is still at 25%. So yeah, and, uh, and that's crazy because he's the starting shortstop on the team with the best record of the National League. <laughs> and he has <laughs> multiple eligibility as well. That's yeah. the problem is they don't know who they are. Even I think Dong City kind of was just describing him as this. Um, oh, man, I forgot what the hell they were, oh, so they were he's saying. Been their, he, he is their shortstop right now. No, they said something peculiar about him uh, uh, being... And I forgot what it was, and, and I was like, man, even – but anyway, it's neither here nor there. But he has three home runs so far uh, this year, uh, 11, 11% walk rate, which is surprising because he, he he profiles, at least when I saw it a while back, as a, as a very aggressive swinger. But 11% walk rate uh, is pretty That'll damn do, good. Donkey. That'll do. <laughs> Highest walk rate on this list of four yeah, players. He, he's, he started walking more in the minors last year as well. Oh, okay. Uh, he, we saw a jump of, you know, six, 7% in the high minors to last year in AAA, uh, 10% walk rate, and now 11% in the majors this year. So that's a, a solid development as well. 385 on base percentage, but mind you, all this is happening with a 358 Babbitt, which uh, there's a little bit of luck factor involved, but still. And, you know, I said that he was aggressive, but he only has a 26.1 outside the strike zone swing percentage and a 44.2 swing percentage, which is pretty low. Uh, I want, I want to say that his, his issue has never really been like chasing a whole bunch. It mm-hmm. was contact. Yeah, you, contact you, can, is... yeah you, can, you, you can even look at his inside the zone. Uh, where was it? Z contact, yeah. Um, sub 80 percent uh that last yeah. year and this year so it's kind of like i guess yeah, you can take that if you're not going to chase a whole lot at all uh but it's a little hard to uh yeah to swallow. he's not javier bias he's like the complete opposite of that but still the contact rates are very comparable 50.9 percent outside the strike zone contact rate and a 69 yeah. percent overall contact rate which is really putrid i mean we're talking those, those are javier bias numbers right there except for the fact that javier bias uh is a hyper aggressive swinger well it's a pretty interesting thing because if you look about it kind of from this perspective of okay when he swings he doesn't make a lot of good contact or doesn't make any contact so if they have him swing a little bit less be more selective I mean, th- that could be a trade-off where if you swing and miss a lot, how do you stop swinging and missing a lot? You stop swinging as much. And you kind of work a little bit deeper and try and get your pitch 
uh, and extend the at-bat. So it's pretty interesting because he's above average in chase percentage this year. That's what I thought just kind of looking at the, the number. But, uh, yeah, he was a guy – I remember him, and I've always kept my eye on him since his debut early yeah. in 2021. Uh, he – I want to say his first career hit uh, – I, I could double check, but I know it was his first career home run – was against the Mets, and it came as a pinch hitter. And then two games – yeah, that was his first uh, major league hit was a home run as a pinch hitter. And then two games later, the tail end of that series – went two for five as the starting third baseman, hit another two home runs. Oh, this was what it was. His first five career hits were all home runs. That was like his little claim to fame there. And I was always like, when I looked at him, he reminded me of almost like a Jazz Chisholm, uh, Isan Diaz, the the two middle infielders from from the Marlins system, the kind of smaller guys that had really good power, especially from the left-hand side. I actually thought Rodolfo was purely a left-handed hitter, but apparently he's a switch hitter. Yeah. I didn't know that. Oh, I didn't know he was. I thought he was right-handed, honestly. Yeah, no, I knew he was lefty because I remember when he hit that first career home run against the Mets. I want to say, who was it off of? Was it off of DeGrom? No, it would have been off of oh, Nick Tropiano. <laughs> Nick Tropiano, former Mets legend. All right, here we go. Since 2021 and up to, to, to 2023 seasons. from So since the 2021 season. Guys with similar outside the strike zone swing percentage and overall swing percentage. So we're looking at numbers around 25% and 40% thereabouts. Yeah. That's where Rodolfo Castro has. Uh, guys and a, and, a, and a below 70% uh, contact rate overall. Uh, guys like Joey Gallo, right? Interesting. Chris Taylor. Ooh. Yeah. Uh, of, the Do- <laughs> of the Dodgers, by the way, just yes. to make sure that there's no confusion there. Wait, uh, what, who's the other Chris Taylor? Uh, I don't know. It's a common <laughs> name. And let's go with Eugenio Suarez, even though he does have a contact rate of 70.9%. So that's well above the 60, the 70%. Uh, yeah, almost 71% there. So he he is in that uh, vicinity. And you know what? Same swing percentage, but a little bit higher contact rate. Aaron Judge at 72% overall contact rate versus the 69% that uh, Rodolfo Castro has been putting up this season. So... This basically says that he should be a Yankees player. Yeah, the thing, just looking at his uh, numbers and expected numbers versus different pitch groups, um, he's hit fastballs relatively well, but he's been pretty lucky. Uh, 327 batting average, 510 slug, 390 Woba, all well overperforming his expected metrics versus those pitches. Um, Still can't hit a breaking ball. He's whiffing 40% of the time against breaking pitches. And against off-speed, he's whiffing nearly half the time. Mm. and is batting 273 with a 636 slug but uh expected average is 185 expected slug 392 uh, but he is hitting the ball hard so when you even when you hit the ball hard you, you whiff a lot but if you're going to hit the ball hard I, I would expect you to overperform at least a little bit uh because even if you're hitting it into the ground maybe it gets down the line you get a, a double extra base hit out of it so uh we'll see I was going to, you know, when I was thinking, like, trying to figure out names that are the complete opposite of Javier Baez in terms of plate discipline, you know, the swing percentages versus the contact rate, I was thinking about Kyle Schwarber, but then I'm like, no, nah, I can't be Kyle Schwarber. Kyle Schwarber is an established power hitter and very very patient hitter, and he's just, you know, he's been proving himself. Kyle Schwarber, though, does have similar swing percentage tendencies, just like Rodolfo Castro, but unlike Castro, Schwarber is at close to 73% contact rate since 2021. The, is that total or in the zone? Overall contact rate uh, is 73%. Because okay. uh, remember, Castro is at 69%. Schwarber yeah. is at 73%. So again, uh, there is such a thing as being too patient, but we, we've mentioned some guys who are extremely patient, who have also uh, made enough contact and made some really good contact in terms of guys like Chicago. Hell, Kyle Schwarber and Aaron Judge, weren't they your home run leaders from last year? Yes, all right, well, there you go. So it's, it's, there's more than one way to kill that bird, right? So <laughs> there's a lot to like with the Rodolfo Castro, but uh, yeah, there's also um, reasons to be cautionary. But yeah, like so I agree with you, Sean. He should be rated a lot higher than that. He should be in a lot more leagues because of the simple fact that he is uh, on on a really good team with the Pirates. Who? What, 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 <laughs> Think about the sentence you just said. <laughs> what time dimension did I just crawl into? Uh, the Pirates are a good team. He's starting, and it looks like even when O'Neill Cruz ever gets, if he ever gets back, 
he's going to be continuing to start and he is a swiss army knife he's their basically yeah. i think that's what vince was trying to say that he's basically their ben zobris i'm like damn I never thought of him like that. I well, I guess was... when if the on base percentage thing can hold, he's a switch hitter. He plays all over the infield. I don't think he's played any outfield. You're on to something there. But it's like I look at it to me, and it's like he seems to have a, such a similar profile to Jazz Chisholm. But hmm. it's like Jazz Chisholm is we we all have love to talk about Jazz, but nobody wants to talk about Rodolfo Castro. <laughs> Well, <laughs> well, it also comes across. I, I am not the biggest Jazz Chisholm fan in the world. So, well, the thing with Jazz is, a Jazz is just like uh, it's like the new Coke. It'll always taste good forever. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, nobody's a Simpsons fan in here. Anyway, uh, all right, let's finish up with this. So that was those were our players, right? Unless oh, did we miss anyone? Yeah, no, just just, just list them off before we go. We had who are your guys? Uh, let's not. I'm just, uh, the guys that we talked about, just in, to sum, sum it up here and take it home. Jaron Duran, Rodolfo Castro, Ezekiel Duran, Blake Sable were the hitters. The pitchers, I have them on the list here. There we are. Uh, Dane Dunning, Bailey Ober, Joey Lucchese, and Tyler Wells of the Orioles. And then our relief pitchers were Nate Pearson and Brian Abreu. Go get so, them, guys. Remember, yeah, we told you uh, first. <laughs> yeah, and those guys are all owned under fifty percent ownership rate across Fantrax and CBS Sports. So, though the more than more than likely, we feel like those guys would still be available and still be good enough to uh, help you help you on your fantasy leagues. Now, now be another if there's a guy like I don't know Brandon Drury available. I guess he's at seventy two percent as of right now. Yeah, Go pick him play, up. He I guess started to play more every day in the last week. I was reading the uh, Fangraphs checking uh, lineups week to week and he had played like eight of the last 10 so if you see tanner bivy available go pick him up yeah, if you see logan taylor bivy. logan taylor allen go pick him up if you see uh what's another guy you say you say kikuchi i say kakachi 80 83 <laughs> percent ownership rate go pick him up jose alvarado go pick him up he's at 80 percent before it's too late so obviously there's other better players but we we, we felt like we, i always like the first of all 50 percent is a good challenge for us mm -hmm. But also, it, uh, we like our chances that those guys that we mentioned on this show today would still be available in across all fantasy formats. All right, let's play a little game. Today's trivia, right here. Oh, trivia. goodness. Oh, goodness. Yeah. So uh, lately, it's been a lot about COVID. So match the player with the exit. <laughs> match <It's> morbid. The... <laughs> what was mighty the mortality morbid. rate for the state you know of Utah? <laughs> you know what's morbid than that? It's the mighty morbid Power Rangers. You know that uh, they've all died, right? Oh, God. It's like a... Power Rangers curse. Our Texas Rangers curse. Anyway, yeah, because the Grom it keeps getting hurt. There he Corey Seager gets hurt. It's a morbid you know who Texas get Power hurt. Rangers. You know who uh, want to get hurt? Chuck Norris. Oh, Chuck Norris. Yeah, the Walker, Texas Ranger. <laughs> Watch, he gets hurt and then all those <laughs> memes go away. We, our childhood's been a lie. How is Chuck Norris hurt? He needs a hip replacement. All right. Uh. <laughs> The question here is match the player with his activity or pastime developed during COVID-19. Oh, so I thought they all got uh COVID because of this of this pastime. But no, match the player with his activity or pastime that he developed during COVID-19. So this is like hobbies that they picked up while they were what? locked oh, down. Oh, okay. I thought this was saying how they got COVID. That, um, yeah, that's what I was thinking too. All right, here we go. All right, who went deep sea fishing? Was it Alex Verdugo, Francisco Lindor, or Lance McCullers, or JT Realmuto? Lance McCullers. Uh, you know, I said that. I said that too. So I'm going to put Sean it says A. All right, who rode his bike up to 49 miles a day around his house? Verdugo, Lindor, or Realmuto? Oh, that seems like something like a, a cracked white dude would do, like JT. But I could see Verdugo like. Because he, he was getting a little husky. Like, uh -huh. uh, I'm going to say Alex Verdugo. Maybe I somebody shit-talked him too hard, and he like, I, took it to heart. I did say um, Real Muto, because I was thinking the same thing. You were <laughs> it's okay if I say it. I, I got you covered, man. <laughs> yeah, thanks so much. Um, he started juicing his own oranges. So Lindor or Real Muto? Lindor. I said the same thing. Yeah. So, so. He's an orange juice kind of guy. Yeah, how do you know that you've been on a podcast with your podcast partner for too long? We're, <laughs> We're basically have the same, same answers, basically. And then when we don't guess, we have the same logic as to why we should have <laughs> guessed the other way. Uh, be he became a dad, so I guess that would be Real, Real Muto. Muto oh, you. that's a little old for him, but 
maybe as a catcher, you know, he he uh, developed a little longer. Yeah, he, he became it, it a high value man, man. He, he got it, that it extra took him longer dough. to develop into a dad. Yeah, just like uh, well, we talk about catchers all the time. They they take longer to develop. All right, here we go. The answer is uh, Verdugo is C. Started juicing his own oranges, so we were both wrong there. Oh, okay. That that seems like something. That seems like something that requires such little effort. Verdugo would actually do it. <laughs> you know, I was leaning that way, but I'm like, no. You know, he's a young guy, uh, so he might have become okay. a dad. And he, real, real Muto became a dad in 2018. I just looked well, it up. We're wrong there. Oh, <laughs> uh, well, so let, 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 one by one. Number two, Francisco Lindor was he was the one who rode his bike, so we're both wrong wow. there. Well, we don't know anything. <laughs> I bet the Dong City guys would have gotten all these right. Uh, Lance McCullers, he became a dad. So I guess. <laughs> and well, Real I guess Muto, when you're hurt as much as him, you don't have to focus on pitching. So focus on parenthood, right? <laughs> uh, Real Muto was the one who went deep sea fishing. Okay, yeah, that that I almost would have picked that too because that's a very uh, southern white guy thing to do. Oh, he's a Marlins player too, ex Marlins player. For, yeah, former Marlins. Yeah, so he, if, if anybody Marlins. knows about deep. <laughs> If anyone knows about deep sea fishing, it'd be a marlin. There you go. Except they yeah. they know it from the wrong end. <laughs> and on that note, any last words from you, Sean? Before we let that's you go? it. Look, get me out of here. All right. Just a programming note. Uh, after much much uh, thought process and all that, as much as I love doing this podcast on a weekly basis, uh, spring and summer are right around the corner. So Sean agreed to do a switch of uh, of the schedule. And it does pay me a little bit to admit to it, but we're going to go ahead and do go every other week from here on out until the, uh, well, unless something big comes up and we feel like, hey, we should probably do a podcast. An, an about instant this. reaction. Instant reaction of some sort or, you know, something, you know, we'll, we'll see what the future holds. But from here on out, it looks like we're going to go every other week. We have it on our calendar because, you know, we figure, well, next week is um, not next week. Sorry. Uh, Mother's Day is right around the corner. Memorial Day is also coming up. We're not going to want to do a show that time. So why do they have all these holidays just jammed into like a six week period? Uh, and, and it's ridiculous. We only look forward to the ones in December and January, and November. But yeah, the other ones are like they're just mad. But when and then they get in the way of our podcasting. But no, we figured like you know we're gonna not want to do a podcast on any of those days. And then I got my my daughter's birthday coming up as as well, so that's gonna take up. So I figured you know let's just go every other week. Let's go every other week. Let's enjoy our summer. Let's enjoy our Sunday mornings with our families. And, and uh, you know, I get to play basketball more days Open. in the morning. So I'll look out for the uh, Felipe injury coming up soon. Fade away, Felipe. I'm sorry, fade away. Uh, yeah. yeah, fade away, Felipe. That, that's got to be, that, that, be your name when you get out there. Old ass Felipe getting hurt on the playground. Yeah, it's not a good look, but still. <laughs> so, yeah, we're going to go every other week. So our next show, it looks like we have a schedule for, let's see what. The, what's the calendar to say oh uh, so today i will definitely i wasn't gonna miss today Sean. be the 14th the 14th is that mother's day <laughs> no <laughs> I, don't I don't know, know. i don't even know i don't anymore. know my day is may 14th is not mother's day doesn't look like it is uh-oh when is mother's day i don't know ah crap maybe it is the 14th oh it is the 14th man <laughs> Oh, all right so we'll, we'll be figure back. something out <laughs> we'll figure something out but anyway sean is over there i am felipe over here thanks for listening we'll see you next time have a good one everybody adios